Welcome, I'm uh, Scott Klinker. I head the 3D uh, design program and tonight's lecture is part of our, um, our public, our fall public le lecture series. So it's great to see so many friends of design showing up. I know we have uh, a lot of friends from U of D out tonight, right? Where are you? All right, it's a lot of you. Thanks for coming, that's great. Um, Cranbrook 3D is um, proud to welcome American designer Stephen Hollenby tonight. Uh, like our own program here at Cranbrook, Stephen has built a reputation of bri bridging the worlds of fine design and industrial design. So we were inspired to ask him um, for a visit and glad he accepted our invitation. Uh, he's already been very generous with our, our students. Um, being a guest critic in a marathon, um, six or seven hour long um, critique yesterday, um, where we reviewed nine projects from our first year students uh, in the Forum Gallery, which is um, which is a part of the the uh, Crafts Building, which is uh, right next door, and the show is called Ideal Home, and the opening is directly after this lecture. So please stick around and join us uh, in the forum gallery afterwards uh, for the opening. Uh, come check out some design work and have a drink and, um, and please join us. Stephen has become a prominent voice in the American design scene, uh, known especially for finding new forms through materials and processes. He is a Michigan native and currently practices in Chicago. He attended uh, Hope College in Holland, Michigan, received a BA in drawing and sculpture there, then later an MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago in 2006. Since graduating, he has worked as a furniture designer uh, at, Ch at Chicago-based Holly Hunt Enterprises and has taught at, at his alma mater um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also a founding member of the experimental design groups, the Mighty Bearcats and the Object uh, Design League, and formed the show Chicagoland, the first uh, Chicago independent designer group show uh, to exhibit offsite at the International Contemporary Furniture Fair in New York. In 2010, he began his independent practice, Stephen Hollenbeek uh, Design Concepts, an interdisciplinary studio concentrating in furniture, lighting, and objects for the home. His work runs the gamut and scale, material, and process, but all exhibit a similar mastery of materials and an aesthetic um, simplicity through a very hands-on experimental prototyping style. So please help me welcome Stephen Hollenbeek. Hey everybody, um, really great turnout, um, flattered. <laughs> uh, um, like Scott said, uh, my name is Stephen Hollenbeek. I work in Chicago now. This is actually my first trip to Cranbrook, um, which I'm a little embarrassed to say, uh, having grown up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, going to Hope College just on the other side of the state um, in my undergrad. Um, so uh, today I wanted to talk about um, my work and the development of my work, but also the development of an independent design studio. Um, I know a lot of people in this room are probably in a position where they're um, ab about to get into um, thinking about what's after school. And um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the way that I did it um, and um, so, and I, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go way back on some of these, um, uh, projects, but, um, cause my, I think my independent design practice started a long, long time ago before, um, I got into, you know, these processes, which are, if you know my work, maybe it's, it's, um, one of these, um, and this is, uh, a piece of my resin bonded sand series, which is the newest work I've been um, working on in the ice cast bronze um, series. And we're gonna get into that quite a bit more a little later on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go way back, way, way back. And uh, so, 
So this is the kind of work I did in like 2001. Um, I was a student at the, in, in college at Hope College and I was doing, this is a pencil drawing actually. So I was doing these like photorealistic style drawings and this is really foggy. There's actually some really nice detail but this was taken from an actual slide which is how old this is. Um, but uh, so, so I was working on these pieces that were um, very process oriented, I guess, in the beginning. This piece took me probably the better part of a year to finish. And I would get into these things and not really care that much about the, the end. You know, I don't, I've never been to Japan. I, I like this piece of architecture, but it's not necessarily, holds no real value for me. Um, but I just wanted to see if I could do it. Um, so my, it wasn't until my second semester of my senior year that I got into uh, sculpture and uh, my very late in the game, obviously, but the whole world opened up once I got off the, the page and into like real materials and you know, I could work in a really hands-on way. But I was still working in a sort of a similar way in that I was um, worried you know, or thinking more about the process of making something as opposed to what the end was. So this was um, the kind of work I was doing way back then. This is a steel sculpture. Um, it's about 12 feet tall and you know four feet wide or so. And I had just learned to use an oxyacetylene torch. So I wanted to see if I could make a very nice um, smooth object with only a torch and a sledgehammer. So I bought this plate of steel, which was like all the money I had in the world, and um, built this frame, laid it down, heated it up about, you know, three inch diameter at a time, and just beat it with a sledgehammer until I created this teardrop shape. Um, this is sort of mid-process. The next thing was to make the whole thing rust. So this is still hanging outside the, the art department at, at Hope College, if anybody is in the area. Um, I think that's as far as I could move it. I didn't know what else to do with it. Um, but this is uh, a photograph of the uh, sculpture studio at Hope College. And um, I, when I was doing the steel sculpture, I was also starting to learn about the, the rich design culture that I was literally sitting in the middle of. Um, these, these are the, uh, these shell chairs that I've been sitting in my entire life. And I'd never really um, realized what they were until I met my sculpture professor, Bill Mayer, um, who's still uh, working in Holland, Michigan, and uh, awesome sculptor, but also sort of a design buff. So he was introducing me to um, you know, the basics of brazing, welding, using a torch, sanding, finishing stuff. Um, and I was really getting into metal processes um, and you know, looking at Richard Serra and David Smith and uh, Lee Bonnecke were some of my favorites. And, uh, but at the same time, I was learning about the Eameses and uh, George Nelson and Saren and Bertoia and um, all these other designers. And, you know, this art center was called the Dupree Art Center, um, which was once where um, J.D. Dupree, DJ J.D. Dupree, um, had a it was a clock factory formerly. Um, so, um, this is uh, the next. This is my first one-man show in uh, Holland, Michigan, Holland Area Arts Council. Um, so, this is kind of where my sculpture went from. Then, this is what I called sculpture. These are obviously lamps, um, uh, but I, I started. Um, I started making pieces that functioned in a way. Um, they, some of them weren't necessarily good lamps, they were just sort of had a lighting element. Um, but I was starting to sort of turn that corner from sculpture and design, but not really uh, thinking about it that way. Um, I, I kind of just mashed the two together. Um, so after this, um, I decided that I was gonna go back to school mostly because I didn't know what else I was gonna do. And I had just sort of scratched the surface of what I wanted to get into like really late in the game. So I, I worked in Holland the next uh, 
two years on a portfolio and does, uh, I uh, applied to seven grad schools um, and I wanted to be a furniture designer. And so seven grad schools rejected me, including Cranbrook. <laughs> um, actually, Cranbrook waitlisted wait me and so did uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and I, I ended up actually going to the Art Institute of Chicago um, more because I just wanted to leave Michigan finally and uh, move to a city. And uh, the, the program was new there and I liked it. Um, thought it would work for me. So um, this is me sort of getting into my grad school work and sort of, you know, thinking about furniture design, but then um, learning about uh, designers like uh, Tobias Wong and all the Droog designers. Um, I loved Dutch design. Um, and also sort of some of the masters in Italy, Castiglione and Enzo Mari, some of my favorites. Um, I started to realize that design was something that I could sort of define for myself. Like b back in school when I was a sculptor, there was this, this stigma that like design was, had this definition and you design either furniture or you're a graphic designer, or you're this kind of designer or that. And um, art was this thing that was really free and you could just sort of um, uh, define that for yourself. And, and that was something I wanted to sort of bring into design. So I started to work on some, some different projects like this, which was this nomadic seating element that you could sort of attach onto uh, pre-existing structures in the, the urban landscape. Um, when I figured that all of these posts that were around like bus stops and parking meters and things all had this exact same diameter. So I could make this thing that was just a simple cantilever that would just um, attach onto them. Um, this was another <laughs> project. Some of these are really cracked me up. Um, I, 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 this was an Ikea hack. Um, and I actually, it started uh, from me being at Ikea buying this stool and it had these really nice bent plywood legs. And um, I was like, oh, these are really nice. This is nice material. So uh, what could I make out of this? So I ended up making this, uh, uh, what I called an object frame, which is um, a frame for objects. Um, and <laughs> super high concept. <laughs> um, but and that, that's kind of the way things worked for me though. Like I would kind of find material or find a process or, and, and then I would kind of design into that. Um, so um, these are my zip tie light kit. Um, um, this was, I, I think it was maybe after reading the uh, Enzo Mari's Auto Projectione um, where Enzo Mari basically created plans that you could go out and you could uh, buy your own materials and produce these uh, pieces of furniture using his, uh, his um, guidelines. So I produced this little booklet and um, these are all materials that you could buy from you know, an Ace Hardware or a Home Depot or something like that and you could make your own um, lights. This is actually a, kind of a horrible design. Um, the, the zip ties all connect to each other and then they actually wrap around like the, uh, the fluorescent tube. So once the tube is dead, then you just spent like six hours putting a bunch of zip ties together. So test your bulbs. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is another project which was sort of an uh, appropriation, um, but I was getting more into like, um, or away from product and more into like installation and other sort of categories of design for me. And this, these were just uh, translucent sort of shoot through umbrellas that a photographer might use. And um, I would, I figured out a way to extend the post on the umbrellas and then make this little hub which would attach to a cord which had a bulb at the end and you would attach these umbrellas on and make this sort of 
half dome thing, and then you would cluster the domes, uh, and it would be this sort of huge cloud, um, which I did back in, I think this is 2007. So uh, the last three projects I, I, I made, but I, had, I didn't even intend to sell them. I didn't even attempt to sell them, even though I started to get some, after sort of putting some of these things online, I would get some calls and emails um, asking how people could buy these, but I just wasn't worried about that. <laughs> so um, I was more interested in uh, coming out of school and then in getting a real job. I wanted some real, some real, um, real industrial design work. And uh, I couldn't find anything. I was working in design retail on the side of grad school and kind of learning about that stuff, but just sort of, it was on the periphery of what I wanted to do, which was actually design objects and products. So I finally got a job in Atlanta um, at a sort of IDO-like uh, company. Um, it was called Formation Design. Um, they were doing a lot of uh, t transportation products. Uh, this was like a sports medical thing that helps you test uh, players for concussions. Um, so I was working on you know, modeling these things, kind of learning solid works and some of those types of things. It was like hardcore industrial design. Um, and I worked there for a little while and it, it was kind of um, really wanting to get back to what I wanted to do in the first place, which was furniture. Um, and backtracking a while, I had been in Chicago and I had been looking for a job. I interviewed with Holly Hunt, which was the furniture uh, company, um, and I had interviewed there probably the f like four times over the course of a year. And I was calling them every two weeks and what's up, what's going on, hire me. But um, <laughs> they they never did until I was in Atlanta, and then they were like, hey, <laughs> you want a job? So so I packed up and um, moved back to Holly Hunt. And I got to like actually cut my teeth in real, real furniture design. Um, so I, I gave this one slide because um, even though this is uh, two and a half years of work, but um, and this was just a, a few of the pieces I designed. There's probably eight or ten total that I did while I was there. But <clears throat> I don't consider this design my design. It was still like I was working under somebody and I had sort of two layers of bureaucracy um, between you know my desk and a produced product and um, but I did get to learn uh, a little bit of woodworking and how upholstery works and everybody in Chicago that does metal work and that upholstery and wood and glass and cast things and and everything. So um, that that was uh, an incredible experience. Um, I also was starting to feel like I, I just had to design my own work. So um, I liked my job there because it provided me money, which is the first time in life that I always I I had a real job that was you know kind of paying the bills finally. So um, my resolve was to do some side work on this, on you know, aside from Holly Hunt, but I couldn't just start making uh, high-end furniture for residents, residences because I had a non-compete with Holly Hunt. So I uh, this led to my next project, <laughs> which which this is probably my most embarrassing slide that I have here. But this is something I designed. Um, while at Holly Hunt working on these like $18,000 cocktail tables and whatever. Um, meanwhile, I'm making these $3 uh, photo paddles. Um, and I probably would have left this out of this presentation, but this was actually really incremental in my um, uh, creating independent practice and starting to work on my own. This is my first commercially successful 
product that, that I had brought from concept, um, prototype that sourced all the manufacturing um, and th through to production and, and distribution. So it's called a, a photo paddle. It's a little acrylic paddle that you hold up in between your camera phone and somebody else and you take a picture, thus superimposing that little image onto somebody else or something else. And so you can give people a mustache. Or, um, there are 18 different ones, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so meanwhile, I'm in Holly Hunt and making photo paddles, and uh, I found myself fired suddenly. <laughs> um, but photo paddles are actually what paid my bills for um, months after that. I started going to some gift fairs, I started making a little money on my own, and um, photo paddle money is what started to fund some of the. Uh, furniture that I had always wanted to make on my own. So this is when I started to um, a real independent practice. Uh, I, I decided at this point I'd had the jobs. I don't want a boss ever again. Um, I only clients. And uh, so I started to produce um, furniture the way I wanted to. And uh, these are part. These are pieces that are in my current um, collection. Uh, this is called the Bully Table. Um, it's entirely made of aluminum. Um, it looks like it's very simple. It's actually made in 17 separate pieces and then assembled, and uh, it's got a custom patina on it. Um, but this was produced in the way that I usually or used to like producing things, which was to find somebody that could do something well, make something well, use a material well, and then I would design into their um, skills. So I found a shop in Chicago that could do this, this brake metal, um, produce things in aluminum, and, you know, hit the finish correctly. And I knew some that could do custom patinas and um, made this piece. Uh, this is another piece called the Coalesce Wall Mirror. And this is similar process, laser cut, um, bent, and assembled. So it's, it's two sheets of pre-polished stainless steel that are um, assembled at the point of the shelf. So you get this uh, ellipse, which is bisected by a smaller ellipse with the, the mirrored image of the shelf. Uh, this is um, my first furniture uh, license. I, I uh, long story, um, got in, in touch with an Italian lighting manufacturer called Leucos. It used to be called FDV Group. Um, and I, I worked on this piece for probably two years, um, starting when, when I was at Holly Hunt and then afterwards. And I submitted this thing to them, not thinking that it was ever going to actually happen, and uh, they said they would, you know, review it for viability or whatever. And I'd heard this a million times, and and didn't you know think it was actually going to happen, like it hadn't before. And um, a few months later, uh, this this full scale prototype images show up in my email. <laughs> I hadn't signed a contract yet or anything, but they just like went and made it. So um, not, not the, the correct process, but it, it ended up sort of working out. So this is a piece that is uh, still in production with FDV Group, or sorry, Leucos. Um, this is another self-produced um, piece called the APOC Desk Lamp. Uh, this is a piece that I, I produce in-house right now. Um, it's it's an entirely reductive process, so I, I wanted it to, to break down and to look like uh, just a pile of sticks, really. I wanted to be able to ship it in a, a tube. Um, and so the way that it fits together is just by cutting these simple um, sliding dovetails into the parts. So you, the, the user gets the piece out and just sort of slots the pieces together and plugs it in, and it's a lamp. So there's a desk lamp, and then there's a, a floor version of this piece also. 
This is the sink side table um, uh, cast glass top on a turned wood base. Um, uh, West Supply makes the top, which is uh, something I'm going to talk about um, soon um, in more detail. But West Supply is somebody I've uh, had a relationship for quite a while. Um, they're a foundry. They make um, cast bronze furniture for the um, for a lot of people like uh, like Holly Hunts and Metalliano and um, different high end furniture manufacturers, but also uh, gallery work for you know Friedman Benda and other other galleries like that. Um, but they make uh, cast bronze and also cast glass works. The, the top was made at West Supply and the, the base is made um, at another Chicago company. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that one. The, the guys that made the, uh, the base have been in Chicago turning wood since the Chicago fire, so like 100 and however many years that is. And West Supply is actually about, at this time, they're about three years old. So it was just a kind of nice collaboration there. Um, still making these web coat lamps, and these are the exact same process as I was doing in 2002, um, working with this uh, um, steel wireframe fabricator in Chicago, and then um, working with the place that actually makes the George Nelson bubble lamps uh, still, which is close to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, they've been my probably longest partnership and one of my best uh, um, allies <clears throat> so I produce, uh, this is a custom lamp, and, and for these pieces, I, I produce almost entirely custom pieces. So I'll produce a drawing and then sort of make them to spec. Um, these are my cast bronze seed bowls, um, pretty straightforward, just cast bronze, mirrored tops, uh, sand, um, uh, just sand cast uh, bottom sides and this is a cocktail table that I actually uh, licensed more recently to Holly Hunt, my former employer that fired me. <laughs> so um, so I yeah these days I, I do a, a, like a lot of different things. I, I've done some consulting a little bit. I, I've, I do these in-house designed and pieces I'm actually making myself and selling. I do some pieces that I outsource entirely to different manufacturers. I'll do a little bit of custom design. If you know interior designer wants to customize one of my pieces, I'll work with them to do that. Um, and then later I've gotten into um, what I just called my unique work, which is the one-of-a-kind objects, the ice cast bronze and the resin bonded sand. So. This is what my studio looks like today. Um, it looks pretty cool. Uh, I, <laughs> this is after probably three or four much crappier studios. Um, but this is actually right above West Supply. I'm in sort of a lofted space above a, a foundry, which is amazing. I just have access to, to this incredible place that can you know, produce cast bronze work. Um, this is another little shot. Uh, you can see my big chest freezer there um, that I'll, I'll freeze blocks of ice in so I can work in the summertime. But before I was here, um, oh, this is West Supply. This is what I'm connected to. Um, this is a portion of it, actually. So this is the, the main foundry portion where they're doing sand casting and then lost wax casting also. Um, and then there's another side of the shop which does the the glass, but before they were in this this beautiful facility, um, they were in this uh, really sort of dingy, crappy one, which um, was sort of how the ice cast bronze process started. Um, this was a building that sort of rained on the inside when it rained on the outside, and it wasn't heated. It was dark. It was um, just kind of um, barely good enough. So. Uh, but I had access to this, um, and I also had access to this. Um, this is the first snowmageddon um, that hit Chicago, I think in the winter of 2010, early 2011 maybe, um, where uh, 
it got so bad that it looked like the you know coming of the next ice age where people just left their cars on Lakeshore Drive and just left. <laughs> they just walked into the city. But uh, the winters in Chicago are intense. If you haven't been there, um, it gets crazy sometimes, uh, especially the next the the last couple years. So um, I had this foundry, and they were making bronze, and I had this naturally occurring ice in the winter. So I started making, I started sort of like mashing the two together. Um, and uh, these are what the, the first ice cast bronze objects looked like. Um, and my first experiment was to just take a little bit of casting wax and to go outside and pour it into like a frozen puddle on the sidewalk. Um, so it was this idea of like this piece being sort of produced by nature or by, by the environment. Um, and I, I picked this little puck of wax up and it had this, you know, that kind of texture. So this got me thinking about, you know, freezing things, pouring into them, onto them. So I just started like chucking stuff in the freezer, like Ikea bowls and whatever I could get my hands on. I was just throwing the freezer pour into it, onto it. Eventually I bought a block of ice. Um, I cut a hole in it and filled it up with this casting wax, which goes in at about 250 degrees. And um, I, I leave it in there for about two minutes or so. So the outer you know, quarter inch or so hardens and the, the rest of the wax on the inside is still liquid. And then I would pour that out and I would have this like vessel form with all that that texture on the outside. So as I fill that cavity full of the wax, the temperature shock is causing the, the wax to do this scrunching thing. Um, so anything that I, this is, if anybody knows foundry work, you know this is way overkill, but um, this is uh, the parts sprued up and uh, ready for dipping. So this is a kind of a common lost wax process after this. Um, those are dipped in a ceramic slurry um, until they get a, a thick coating on the outside. And then the top is cut off and they're put in a kiln, burned out. Um, so you have this ceramic shell, which is empty on the inside. And then they're uh, poured with bronze. And then once that cools, um, you break the shell on the outside and you have that piece in bronze. So <clears throat> um, you cut the sprues and vents off and, and there's your piece in bronze. So uh, this, this is the first little set of three that I produced in I think 2011. And um, you can see the Ikea bowl on the right there that I just kind of swished around. <laughs> Um, and from here, it was just kind of dialing in the process, and it still is, and that's all this whole collection is. It's just kind of working with this in this process and adding little variables and sort of dialing in um, the, the process to get different results. So the, one of the first things I found that I could do was instead of pouring the wax out, I would ladle it out. So each time I take a ladle out, drops the level of the wax down and I get this sort of rippled topography on the, the inside of the piece. And also at this point, I had to decide whether, you know, this was gonna be um, an unlimited edition, like a, you know, production, or this was a limited edition, or that these were um, each one of a kind. and. I thought it was sort of a nice idea that, that each piece starts with ice and ends in bronze, So, um, which is the way I've done it ever since. Uh, so each of these pieces starts with me carving ice and pouring wax, refining the wax, and then going through the process of creating the piece in bronze. So from here on, I start, like, my drawings are becoming like these little comic strips. Um, all about process, um, not necessarily about, you know, what the thing is going to look like in the end, but just about like ways that I could um, produce a, a piece differently. Um, 
and eventually I wanted to get larger and larger and go into different furniture uh, categories. So um, this is my little uh, ideas of how I might be able to make a table. And some of these plans would, would necessitate new equipment, uh, things that I, I couldn't find elsewhere. So um, the thing in the upper left is something that I actually freeze into a bucket um, to create legs for furniture pieces. So I'll freeze those tubes in, then I'll pour hot water into the tubes, pull the tubes out, and then I'll, I can fill those little cavities with uh, the wax. The squirt gun thing is used for like injecting hot water into places so that I can release some of the waxes because they tend to get stuck in there sometimes. And uh, we'll see some of these other things later in action, but um, this is the way I was starting to make uh, a tabletop, so just carving into the ice um, a little bit and then you know, carving a, a little bit of leg on it. And uh, my first legs were made this way. This is one thing that was sort of a failure. I thought I could just drill that hole with a, a long drill bit, but it ended up just like chopping the ice up and the wax would just fill this bucket, which led to some pretty interesting little thingies, but uh, not legs. Um, this is kind of how I produced the one of the tabletops. That's that table. Um, so you can see the little see the little mushroom things on there. This is some of the the stuff that I love about this process and some of the things I'm taking like detailed photos of and the best parts of this process are things that I couldn't possibly um, design, you know. So um, it was all about that those processes. Um, so the first collection of ice cast bronze pieces were um, they, they took pretty normal forms. They were a tabletop and they had, you know, four legs. Um, and all the really good stuff was happening on the bottom of the tabletop that you couldn't see it. Um, so my next idea, so this is like how the bottom, this is the wax of the bottom of that oblong table. Um, my next idea was to try to produce this table with all this texture on the top and visible surfaces. So I took a page from the playbook of uh, my Midwestern family. We used to do this thing where we would create uh, an ice skating rink in our backyard. I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but you make this thing from two by fours and uh, plywood and you just stamp the snow down till it's all packed down. Then you put the sprinkler on it and you let it uh, wet it down and then you let it freeze over and then you do that again until you get like a thick coating of ice and then you can skate like in your backyard or whatever. Um, so I made this thing and I, I, <clears throat> I punched out the form of a, a table uh, with the legs sort of splayed out to the sides. Um, and then I iced it over and then I used that as uh, my pouring form. So this is my rooftop right outside of my studio. So the, the, actually the process kind of started outdoors and then it went indoors and with my freezers and then uh, going back outdoors allowed me to work at this different scale. I also like the idea of using natural elements, um, the natural cold to, to produce these pieces. So these are these waxes. So I poured them flat and then right at the right time I folded the legs up and got these forms, which are, are good but they're, they're still a little predetermined. I never actually ended up making these in, in bronze. Um, and the things I, again, really like about the process are those little things that you can't plan, these little mushrooms on the side of this vessel, um, things that I never could have um, thought might happen. Uh, so I wanted to think about a way I could make these pieces and further remove myself and my design intent um, from, from the work. So 
this is a year later, um, I got myself some kiddie pools and put them out on the roof and filled them with uh, two inches or so of water and started to pour uh, these free form uh, flat pieces. Um, and I could sort of decide where my hand is, where I'm pouring the wax, but the wax just goes where it wants and it finds its own way. So these are some of uh, the new waxes I was producing, which are a lot more interesting to me. This one is so weird and I have no idea why it looks like that. It just, it, it just, it was the right temperature and the wax was the right temperature and it just got really weird, so. Um, but this is, this is what I love about the, the process. It's just like kind of a surprise every time. It's just a constant discovery. Um, so this is, uh, this is a cocktail table. This would, would become one of the biggest pieces I've done yet. That's the parts and shell, and that's the, the cocktail table. So I was getting much more like uh, free form with the pieces. Um, let's see some of the texture there. Uh, so th this piece had to be made in, made in uh, 16 separate castings. So the, the, the tabletop parts were cut into manageable sections and then cast in bronze and then re-welded and then I had to uh, patch in the texture where those welds were. So there's actually, I think, one, two, three, four, four or five visible welds like straight across the, the texture of the pieces in this, in this image. So there's a whole other side to this process, which is, and once I've blasted this all over Instagram, which I do all the time, um, people start to want to uh, ask about commissions and things like that. So I, I do often need to, I can't always just kind of play, like climb out the window and pour on some snow. So um, it, it's often that I have to predetermine what, what the form will look like. So this is a, a, a commission proposal, um, and which actually didn't work out, which is also what usually happens. Um, people say, I want that, and they say, oh, that's way too expensive. <laughs> um, so I made, I made this table anyways. Um, this is carving the ice. Sometimes the ice takes, um, I wonder if this video will play. Oh, yeah. So the table is made in sort of two similar sides. Um, and, and then here's a little video of me using that special tool of mine. <laughs> um, something like this, which is longer, would always get stuck in the wax. So I was sort of pumping hot water down into the bottom. Um, and this was the wax for that. This is a side table. Um, so I, I usually build the piece full scale in wax and then really refine it and then uh, break it into pieces again to make them manageable cast parts. So this is the uh, ice cast bronze side table number four. Uh, moving on, more uh, plans of process variation, um, and this is something that I, that I thought would work, um, but this is getting back into more vessels and thinking about a different way of producing them. So I had this idea that I could hollow out a, a bucket of ice, um, pour wax in from, and put it on its edge, so it's the wax in there from the bottom edge to almost spilling out, and then just rotate the uh, the form and then create this uh, wax shell which um, probably like 10 tries later worked uh, so this is this is the the way that I've been producing the most recent ice cast bronze uh, vessels 
so that that little jagged two by four thing is something that I cut so I can um, move the the bucket one little notch and it'll it'll stay where I put it um, and with that little variation of the process I get this entirely different uh, texture and this whole different feeling to the the pieces so this is what the the vessels start to look like sort of a longer linear um, texture and this is a pretty recent one you can see the the bronze on the left side is it, it gets that's where I started rotating and you can see there's like really little micro ripples. Um, that's when the ice was really cold and the wax was really hot. And uh, after a full rotation, I got to this place where the, um, at the end where the, the wax has um, cooled down a lot and the ice had warmed up a lot. So the wax is sort of freezing against only the, the cold water. Uh, so I was getting these big fat ripples, which would, you know, take a really nice polish. And this is very recent. I'm working on uh, the first ice cast bronze chair. Um, this is very mid-process. It might change quite a bit, actually. Um, uh, and then getting into some mega-sized uh, vessels, which are me stacking ice on top of each other and then tunneling through it and uh, using that as the mold. Um, so this is uh, more, more, more recent, um, maybe last February, where I, I got into my next sort of process-driven collection called the Resin Bonded Sand Series. Um, and this, this is bonded sand that uh, West Supply uses um, day in, day out. Uh, it's a material, it's a really cheap material um, that's mixed with a, le uh, a resin and then packed onto pattern boards. And then um, two of those parts are put together forming a flask, which is what they'll pour bronze into. So these things lined up here are all uh, molds that are waiting to be poured with bronze. So it, it's a one-time use material, and they'll pour the parts, and then they'll break it off with a hammer, and all this is just scrap. So um, me being just a complete tinkerer, I would just pick this up, and I'd start to kind of play with it. I'll take it up to the studio and just have it and stare at it for a while, and just every now and again, I'll pick it up and think about it. And um, So this probably started two or three years ago. Uh, it wasn't until this uh, February when I actually started to um, do something with it. Uh, so, so I would kind of start to figure out how I, I could put a texture on this. And um, I happened to be working on another project where I was using some resin. And uh, I took that chunk that I had just had around for a while and I painted resin on this, this sand. It's soaked in, and I, I let it cure, and the next day I kind of carved out the rest of that bonded sand from the inside, um, creating a vessel form. So um, this was my, my next process. <laughs> so I figured out some ways that I can um, use wire brushes and different ways of um, like pounding on them and linear scraping and I can produce this sort of uh, wood-like texture or these, these, oops, no, these different little spines and stuff. I found these, uh, this die grinder and these different like rasp bits which are made for I think wood carving. I bought them for art, ice carving which they work very well for uh, but they also work really well for carving sand, I found also. So the, the sand, as I find it in the foundry, has this consistency where it's, it's, uh, it's, it stays together, it, but it, if you rub it, you know, the, the sand will kind of come off. You can kind of break it apart a little bit, but it has this, this very carvable,
consistency. So this is one of the first vessels. And then once I paint the resin on, I leave that little uh, portion at the top open and I can extract all that sand from the inside. So this is what my studio starts to look like more recently, kind of like a beach. And um, just trying some different forms. Some of the, the forms are very organic. Some of them are um, these faceted objects. Some of the, the broken chunks of sand end up kind of looking like, um, like they, like I, le I kind of leave them how they are. I, I find them in the foundry and they look like a cactus already. <laughs> so I just sort of take it the rest of the way. Um, so I, I like having this sort of serendipity about the way that the, the pieces are, are broken off and the way I find them. Um, this is putting the resin on. So the resin can be uh, dyed. I'll add pigments to the resin and one, once the resin goes on, it, it penetrates about an eighth to a quarter inch and once we remove everything from the inside, we're left with just that, that blue resin sand stuff. Got myself a sandblaster recently. Um, this is kind of fun because I, I actually just picked up a bunch of sand off the floor of my studio. I threw it in the sandblaster and then I use it to blast sand, which is just sort of adding more like sandblasting media into the sandblaster. So it's like this kind of circular process. Um, there's that piece. So this process is, is pretty new to me, and I, I, I really like the agility that I can use when, when working on the, these objects. Bronze is so expensive and so prohibitive in that way, and I had to really like plan and, and save my money, and, and uh, the, the sand I can just kind of plow through, and if it's something I don't like, um, close to the end, I'll just scrap it, throw it back in the dumpster where I found it in the first place. Um, so I can be really agile about the way that I, I work with the sand, which is, feels really great and free. So um, just, uh, it's just like the ice cast bronze has been the, this ongoing experiment and thinking about different ways that I can um, produce different object categories and textures colors, and then obviously I want to go as big as I can go. So um, this is when I started getting into the first furniture pieces. So um, this wasn't scrap material. This was, uh, I would have West Supply actually produce a just a solid block for me. So I'd make a, a plywood perimeter and put it on a pallet and they would just pack their bonded sand into it and um, the stuff cures in about 20 minutes so um, 20 minutes later I had this thing and this is like an eight nine hundred pound block of sand and I was gonna make a table out of this this that was the idea but uh, I stared at this thing for like two or three weeks not knowing like how to get into it um, it was so pristine, um, and I needed to figure out some way to just start. Starting is always like the, the hard part. So uh, I think it was on the other side. I just I cut a hole. I just started. I just cut a hole in, in the side of it, and I made it like a square. Um, and that square started to look like a little room, like uh, walls, floor, ceiling. So I started to think about the pieces, uh, a little piece of architecture. So I would cut another hole in the other side and um, eventually that little room would sort of connect to the other room uh, through doorways and hallways and things and um, I kind of went on from there. But I had to produce a, um, 
kind of a criteria by which I carved this block. So, and, and these are how I extracted the bulk of the material. I'll just cut um, a grid work of the material out and then just pop the pieces out with a hammer and just keep moving through it that way. So the sand, the sand stays together enough that I can carve it till it's like a half inch thick and it's, it's pretty stable. Um, but once I put resin on it, it's, it's like rock solid. So I went over this whole thing. I um, textured every part of it inside and out. And um, once I was happy with it, I started to soak it with resin. Um, this one, I decided to do black. And uh, so I did the bottom side first. I think it was like six hours straight of constant resin soaking. And then I flipped it over and did the, the top side, carved the top and, and then um, resin it. So this is the end piece. Um, so there's actually a, a way, if you were like a little mini man, you could get from the top surface of this table and you could actually kind of walk through the entire piece, through the little doors and hallways, all the way down to the floor. Um, and then uh, decided to go bigger yet. This is the uh, resin bonded sand console um, starting. This is a 1,200 pound block of sand. And again, there, you know, I, I actually attempted to make some drawings and plan out some ways that I might, um, how this thing might end up looking, but uh, none of them really made any sense to me and it, it didn't, nothing worked out until I actually just started to carve the piece. So it was just kind of a constant cut some parts out and then you know, walk around it and stare at it for a while and then cut some more parts out and then kind of keep going through the material. Um, so this is nearing the end. So you can see some of the little doorways and halls and rooms and spaces. Um, resin coated this thing. This was just a, a white or like a natural color resin, just leaving it sand colored. And that was the piece in the end. So this is this is my most recent work. Um, so I'm, uh, it, it's actually really still very new also. I just started this in February. Um, I'm kind of getting into more just process variation, um, starting to work with um, a 3D sand printer now, um, somebody who will print me 3D printed sand objects and I can then just texture or carve a little bit and you know, apply resin and um, call it good, so I'm working on some modular things uh, which become tables and different sort of furniture pieces. Um, but yeah, it's just a, an, an ongoing process. Um, this is actually my last slide and one that I'll end on. Um, this is something that like just happened and I love it so much. Uh, this happened inside the, the sand blaster. Um, just s some random stray drips of resin ended up on the top of the, the portion which I was going to blast out and then in blasting that out found that it, the resin acted as, as kind of a, a, a spray guard or like a shield. So um, I'm starting to think about ways to, to use this. So um, taking the sand, painting resin on certain portions, sandblasting it partially and then putting resin on it again and then you know making these these uh, different objects with these prongs and different um, places where it might get sheen on the the parts that are pulled out um, but we'll see um, invite me back and I'll show you some more um, but <clears throat> yeah so
that's uh, most of my presentation. I, I uh, would love to take some questions. Um, I guess I, I didn't, I guess I started talking more about work than, than private practice, but if anybody has questions uh, with regard to, you know, the independent practice or anything like that, um, it would be great.